So today I'm going to pull together some current threads um, just because things are moving so fast. We should think together about the rush to move this world to digital dollars. Uh, such a move would have a very great impact on the work of the church. And uh, so I'm going to, here's a little kind of an outline of what I'm going to do. These things sort of don't seem off the cuff, to, off the front to fit together, but I think we'll fit them together a little bit. Um, first, we'll start with Jesus in the temple, and then we're going to talk about digital dollars, religious liberty, and uh, this probably sounds kind of highbrow, but I didn't make it up. Laudate Deum. Has anybody here heard about Laudate Deum? This, every now and then, the Pope comes out with a, an encyclical, a letter he writes. Usually it's written to his fellow Catholics, but the last couple of them, Laudato Si and Laudato uh, Deum, have been written to all of us. So there's a letter from the Pope to you, just waiting in your inbox. And so uh, I'm going to quote some parts from it, probably not the parts that other people will be quoting. All right, so that's kind of what we're going to do. There's a little, little bit of a road map today, but let's open our Bibles to Matthew 21. We really are living in some extraordinary times. So extraordinary that it's, it's almost hard to keep up. We're just living in a time when lots of, lots of things are happening. Well, I want to read just two verses here with you at Matthew 21 verses 12 and 13, and uh, Jesus, you know, he's, he's going to cleanse the temple. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. The marginal reading there says a robber's cave. And if we continued reading our scripture reading in, in Revelation 13, verse 16, it goes on to verse 17, uh, which says that uh, you will come to a spot where you will not be able to buy or sell. And so as I was studying, I kind of found where do we find the first place where buying and selling is connected in the New Testament? Well, it's right here. It's at the, where Jesus is running the money changers out of the temple. Jesus cleansed the temple, and maybe a lot of us don't really know the background of it. You see, many worshipers would come from long distances to worship at Jerusalem, and, and they couldn't bring their animal sacrifices conveniently, and so they would come, and then they would buy their sacrifices at Jerusalem. And so over the years, uh, some smart person noticed that they could exploit this, and they developed a special system of money called the temple shekel the temple shekel. You could only buy sacrifices for the temple with the temple shekel. And so what had happened was that these, this group of uh, people developed this monopoly. And so you would travel, travel a long ways. You come to Jerusalem. Now you've got to put your sacrifice in. And you would bring your money from wherever you brought your money. And then the, there were people there that were money changers. And they would, at an exorbitant fee, they would change the money that you brought and charge you extra to get a temple-approved sacrifice. And you paid for it. You could only buy the sacrifices, you see, with the temple shekel. So you were, they had you over the barrel. You had to change your money, your regular money, at an exorbitant rate for temple money. And then you'd use the temple money to buy your sacrifice. And then you could make your sacrifice. So they were exploiting people right and left, north and south, all over the place. And finally, Jesus enters the temple. And this is one of the more uncharacteristic kinds of things. People say, well, Jesus, Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But here he is, and he's overturning the tables. He's tipping them over. The seats of those who were selling dove, they had, and Jesus was tipping over their seats. And this isn't the sort of the standard behavior of Jesus, is it? But he said, remember what he said, my house is to be called a house of prayer. He's quoting from the book of Isaiah. And, but he said, you have made it a robber's den. You see, Jesus, what was happening here was 
this system of the money changers arose where they would exchange this for the temple shekel. What they were doing, they, were, they injected their money system into life in such a way that they could profit at the expense of worshipers. And Jesus vigorously repudiated this practice. How did he do it? He entered the temple and he physically overturned the tables and the chairs and drove them out. And when Jesus was they left. They got up and left. They weren't going to hang around. And they, they came out of the temple and they were surprised this, this kind of thing would never happen. But, but they, they felt like they had to leave. And so he drove out these people who were buying and selling in his temple. And then his statement was, as we say, unambiguous. My house shall be called a house of prayer. You're making it a robber's den. The practice was made unfair there was a mismatch between the goal of worship and the goal of controlling the money. That's what they were doing. They were controlling the money. The book of Proverbs mentions uh, many statements. I've just put a couple up here uh, that would be Jesus' feeling about weights and measures. In other words, uh, commerce, just commerce. So, for example, Proverbs 11.1, 1, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. I mean, that's... When something's an abomination to the Lord, that's about the most severe language that the Bible will ever use. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. And you see, remember, when people would buy things and sell things there, the, you would go to the person. The, you didn't carry your weights around to check the weights of the, of the seller. The seller, wherever the seller was, had his weights, he had his scales, and so you, you're coming from wherever you're coming from, and you're not carrying these big heavy rocks in your pocket. And so they would come and try to make an arrangement and bring their coin and make an exchange. Well, I'll, and they haggled it down to a price and say, okay, I'm going to buy this many potatoes for this, for this much, you know, coin. And so if there was a, uh, if you were the guy that was selling it, and if you were crooked, if you were dishonest, instead of having a regular weighted weight, you would change the weight of your weight so that you could exchange their coin and they thought they're getting more for their money than they were. They're getting less because you actually, as they weigh it out in the scale, it looks like, oh yeah, this must, it's coming out fair, but it's only coming out what appears to be fair because that weight is a fake weight. And Jesus in God, in the book of Proverbs, he says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. Because it gets in and it is, it is a, an attempt to control the situation. You're controlling the money. And so, but God says a just weight is his delight. He likes it when it's fair. He likes it when 100% uh, is actually 100% and it's not 82%. In Proverbs 16, 11 and 12, Another, just another one, and I, there's several of these, but I've just got these two I wanted to bring to you. A just balance and scales belong to the Lord. All the weights of the bag are his concern. It's an abomination for kings to commit wicked acts for, the, for a throne is established on righteousness. So now here are two Proverbs right next to each other, verse 11 and 12, that talk about just weights, fair measures, fair, a fair control of the money. And side by side with that is it's talking about kings and either a righteous or an unrighteous government. And see, but who controls the money supply? Well, the government is kind of in communication, is kind of in connection with the, the Fed, which is actually kind of a private corporation. But, uh, but the government, it's all kind of tied in together and, that, and you have your, your greenbacks that, you know, are American dollars. So today, a just weight would also still be God's delight, and it would still also be unrighteous if there was a, a combination of government that was messing with your money. And of course, we're on a fiat system of money, which leads to great inflation. And uh, there's a box of cereal that I sometimes buy. It's usually... Uh, Four dollars and ninety-five cents, and I just saw the other day. It suddenly it's five dollars and ninety-five cents, and it used to be a lot less than that. I mean, we've all seen these prices changing because there's in inflation. I'm not here to talk about inflation, but what I want to say is this: God is very unhappy when a false weighting is applied in commerce. Remember, for commerce, they use scales. I just kind of described all that. 
So Jesus drove out the money changers because they had inserted themselves into the system of commerce and they had exerted unjust control. These men had become agents of their own agenda to unjustly control the people, and Jesus was righteously enraged. And so Jesus drove them out of the temple. So there's a phenomenon that I think is pretty clarifying, and um, it's, a, it's called governmentalities. You've probably never heard that word, but uh, a fellow, Michael Rechtenwald, year for years has been a commentator, and he coined this word in a book I'm reading right now. Let me describe it to you. Governmentalities, as he describes them, are private corporations working in tandem with governments in order to achieve particular ideological or political agendas. Um, this is the phenomenon of governmentalities is a combination of the state and of mega corporations. Now, everyone used to call that fascism. When you have government and corporations, private industry or corporations working together for a common goal, that's, that's literally def 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 definitionally. The definition of it is that's fascism. But we almost don't want to use that word anymore today. That word's become a little bit too spicy because fascism is exactly what's happening right before our eyes. And it's also often misused and then people use it to attack this and that that are often have nothing to do with fascism. But just strictly speaking, technically speaking, the actual definition of fascism is when government and industry get together and everybody rubs everybody else's back and they all have a great, a great time. Uh, this is what happened in Nazi Germany. The big corporations, the big industries combined with the German government, and uh, the Nazis were happy all day long. Uh, this is also, by the way, what happened in World War II with Japan. In Japan, the, the political powers, uh, the, the emperor is kind of king, sort of a semi-god figure, um, along with the, the military uh, corporations there that made all the military gear. They were itching to have a fight and make more military gear. Of course, what's probably the number one thing America makes today? Military gear. Anyway, governmentalities. Everyone used to call it fascism, but now we don't really think of it that way. But that's really what it is. It's the, the power of the state augmented by using the capabilities and assets of corporation to advance state goals. And this, com this combination of government and governmentalities can accomplish things that the state itself is legally forbidden to. Uh, here's just one example, and uh, all these examples, I get, tried to give you more current examples. i um, trying to remember here what the date is, October 6. So what day is today? October 7. This is from yesterday. This is a news article from Firestone, Colorado. Automatic license plate reader cameras coming to Firestone. And have you, ever, have you ever heard of LPRs? That's what they're called, license plate readers. Okay? And this is just one example of it. Um, and you can read the article, go online and read the article. Um, and the local people there say, well, we, we're just using it constitutionally. It's no problem. But what it is is they're working with a private company. The private company has set up license plate readers. And when you drive by a license plate, have you driven by a little sign? There's usually one on Curve Street going down through Nuevo, toward Nuevo, right? There's usually one I see when I go through there that always tells you your speed. And sometimes there's one here locally. And uh, it, now that is reading your speed, but they also have devices that are called LPRs. And what they do is they're set up to automatically take a picture of your license plate. Now guess what? Because of the Bill of Rights, because of the United States Constitution, the government can't use those. But corporations can, exactly. And so that it is a backdoor, an anti-constitutional backdoor. And so what Firestone is doing, and I've read about it in several other places. I give you many other examples. The government is, con in this case, it's the local government. They, this city is contracting with a private company. The private company can operate license plate readers all day long, and they are. And they are taking pictures in certain streets, and cars drive by, and you drive by. You don't know you've triggered their LPR, but it takes a picture, get your license plate, and that's all connected by your, your, uh, you know, your, your DMV. It's all connected, and so they can see. And of course, there it's true 
they say, well, we're just trying to find stolen cars and, and stuff like that. But what happens then is that the United the local government is purchasing. I wonder whose money is being used to make those purchases. I'm just trying to figure that out. I can't figure out whose money that would be. But anyway, they're using somebody's money to make these purchases. They're buying this data from these companies that they cannot constitutionally themselves collect, but they're allowed to buy it. And they're buying that, and then they can tell uh, whether, what, where cars are traveling and so on. And of course, supposedly it's okay, it's, we're just trying to find some stolen cars. But I read of a case, and I forget if it was Connecticut, um, somewhere up there. Up there, and there's actually currently a court case going on. And uh, there's a place there that they call a drug corridor. There's a place where there's certain behaviors that people who are selling drugs often have and how they travel. And they set up the same deal as this, and they found this fellow, I can't remember his name, and he probably was selling drugs. They caught him with drugs. And they checked to find out how it was they caught him, and the only thing they had to start with was LPR data. He was pulled over on the basis that he fit a certain profile, and apparently he was selling drugs, so that's not good. I'm not for that. Are you for that? We're not for that. But, um, but the, the information was collected unconstitutionally. And so that case is liable to be thrown out or decided um, out of court so they don't lose the precedent, don't set a precedent of having their data thrown out. Anyway, this is just one case, just one case among many of, um, of what you have where we have this combination of government and private corporations working together for certain reasons. And here maybe there's some good reasons, you know, maybe we're going to catch some of the drug dealers. I'm for catching drug dealers, but I guess I'm for catching drug dealers constitutionally. It's just sort of the way I am. Uh, when Twitter or Google or Facebook combine with government to push one narrative and to squelch other views, they are acting as governmentalities. All around ourselves, this texture of government and governmentalities is increasing very rapidly, and it's quietly exercising power over our lives. The New Testament warns us of vast changes that will come in the culture. And what we're seeing, I think, is some of these changes now. Over in Matthew 24, Jesus warned, and among his things in Matthew 24 was verse 7, he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, usually we think about that in terms of um, like World War II, you know, this side with its tanks and guns and, and airplanes against that side with its tanks and guns and airplanes, and that's nation rising against nation, kingdoms fi fighting it out. But have you heard of this, fifth gen warfare? Have you heard of that? Because they say really that that is um, that kinetic, you know, the actual like World War II, that's like third generation warfare. And then when they get to fifth generation warfare, here's sort of a definition of it. Warfare that is conducted primarily through non-kinetic military action, such as social engineering, misinformation, cyber attacks, along with emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence and fully autonomous systems. Fifth generation warfare has been described by so-and-so, Daniel Abbott, as a war of information and perception. And some have said, including Dr. Robert Malone and many others, that presently we're in, engaged, there is a war going on, and, but it's not a normal war like we think of third generation war. It is a war for the mind. It's, it's changing how we think about things. And this has been labeled, and some don't like the label, but they're calling it fifth generation warfare. Friends, what if the fifth generation warfare is happening right now, and what if the war is for your mind and my mind? Jesus said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And the language I'm hearing all over the place is, and I think it fits, is we're basically in the middle of a cultural revolution similar to what happened in China in the 1960s and 70s. The same kind of thing is happening in America. It's not to the extent as it was in China, but uh, there are dramatic changes. All this crime, looting, big, uh, big stores are being closed in some of our large cities. Uh, because they can't, you can't afford to run a store there when you just have people come in and loot and take stuff and leave and the police don't do anything about it. 
and the world is changing around us, will we ever have a correct or fair um, See, and I'm thinking about what I say right now because if this ever goes out onto um, social media, it could, get, it could get thrown off because I said the wrong thing. I mean, that's where we are today. But every four years we have, we have a little event that happens, usually in November. And I wonder if we'll ever have a fair one of those again. Maybe we will. I, I don't know. But uh, interesting things. Uh, happening in our world. Jesus' warning about nation rising against nation, I think it includes this idea, and we shouldn't really be surprised about this trend. Is it far-fetched to think that Lucifer and evil men would work to remake the world in their image? Because really what they're doing, and I think I've said it here before, and I'll say it again, I'm sure, we are living in Genesis 1. The world that God made, where a, a man is actually a man, and a woman's actually a woman, and a cat's actually a cat, that world is being remade all around our ears today. And we're being told that, no, a man is not necessarily a man. A woman's not necessarily a woman. And blah, blah, blah. And all these things are changing all around our ears. Now, the governments and the governmentalities of the world are in a race to move us all over to digital currencies. And they're, they're called CBDCs, Central Bank Digital Currency. That's what a CBDC is. I'm just going to refer to them as digital dollars a little bit simpler, I think. And um, right now, there's a big move on to make this change and move everybody over to digital dollars. Now, what they are, they are basically programmable coupons. Each one has its own kind of like serial number, and they rep represent some unit of money. Unlike most physical dollars and coins, digital dollars are fully programmable and fully traceable. So this is what they want. There's a, a large movement around the world on, uh, many, among many of our governmental leaders, they want to move us to the place to where it's, we no longer have paper money, and paper money has its problems, but they want us to have digital dollars. And what that means is that every, in a, every single transaction would be tracked. If, if I saw a, a lemonade stand this summer somewhere here by Fremont and there was little girls there selling lemonade on a street, if we were in a, an economy that was totally digital dollared, you would not be able to buy lemonade from those little girls at their lemonade stand without spending it and doing it with digital dollars. I mean, the government would know that those little girls made X amount of money from people buying lemonade from them. Yeah, that makes it possible to tax it out. So, um, in an economy run on digital dollars, Big Brother is constantly looking over your shoulder. He always knows exactly who bought what from whom, who gave what money to whom, and the people who control the financial system always have their finger on the cancel button. If you wish to make a purchase, and maybe the state does not approve of that purchase, the state can either override your purchase, you know, uh, transaction declined, or they can allow you to make the transaction and do like they do in China, in China where they have social credit score and your social credit score will go down. Does the Bible say anything about digital dollars? By the way, here's a little, a, a couple of things in case you're saying, well, yeah, he hasn't showed us any evidence yet. This is a, uh, a website, you can find it. Um, it's called CBDC Tracker. And this is a status in the world of all the different nations and where they are on developing these digital dollars. You'll notice the, the blue color, uh, only in Nigeria, and you can't quite see it. Uh, here in the Caribbean, they have the sand dollar. And there's another one, I think, on Cyprus or somewhere, or Malta up there in the uh, European, in the Mediterranean Ocean. But there's only two or three that really have active current digital dollars. The, so that's the blue. The purple ones, uh, I'm trying to remember here, what is it? Yeah, proof of concept. A pilot program, you see Russia and China, they're very advanced. China's on the point of actually having a full-blown CBDC. They're using it in five now of their major cities. It's 
covering just millions, hundreds of millions of people. Um, Russia has got the uh, digital ruble, and as of, I think, what it was, July 22, they were actually going to go live in July, but they're, 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 I just saw an article, I don't think I put it in here. Um, they're not live yet with the full-blown thing, but they're on the verge, Russia's on the verge of it. Um, and then you have the places that are working on it, and then you have research, and you have America there because the Americans are working on it. And in fact, here is, uh, if you look for um, the executive order 14067, which was from uh, March of 2022, I've read this executive order, kind of boring, but I read it uh, several pages long, and uh, my printer, I had to pay for the print pages. Uh, this is an executive order by the current president, ensuring responsible development of digital assets, and it's preparing the way for us to have a digital United States dollar. Uh, and there's more things I can bring up. Here's one more. Uh, you see up there in the corner, upper right, upper left corner rather, if you can read it, it says Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. This is a study. Boston Fed, MIT, complete research project into feas feasibility of a central bank digital currency. They called it Project Hamilton. And at the bottom here of the page, you can see the date for 22, uh, 2022. They finished this study and then, uh, and I think I have this backwards. I was going to put in the, uh, the, the, um, the president's executive order. I think maybe his order came out before that. His order came out in the middle of 2022. They finished the study at the end of 2022. By the way, the president's executive order wants them to be ready within 18 months with a plan to do digital currency. And we're nearing the end of that time. Something has come up also that just started in July called FedNow. And um, some people are convinced that's a doorway into uh, digital dollars. And I'm still kind of somewhere in between the cracks of my time. I'm trying to read about it. I haven't really read enough to say anything that makes sense to you or to me. So I didn't add, uh, didn't talk about it. But uh, I want you to realize that in the Bible, we're told about a threefold group, Revelation 18, verses 2 and 3. And he cried with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Now listen to the groups. You have Babylon. And then he goes on to say, For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality, the wealth of her luxury in the margin reading, and those, there's two. And then the third one was Babylon itself. Babylon and these two kind of lower sections, Babylon is the control at the top, or the whole piece, and then you have the kings of the earth, you know, the political leaders, and you have the merchants of the earth, that's your big tech corporations, your governmentalities, as Michael Rechtenwald calls them. And this, this is what was written, though, about 2,000-ish years ago. That at the end of time, because in Revelation 18, God destroys Babylon, when you go a little bit further. <clears throat> but there's this union of these three powers, Babylon, the political part, and the, the corporations. And there it is. It's all laid out there. And when John was given this prophecy, I'm sure John, John had never been in a mire or a Walmart so that would be probably kind of new to him. But anyway, here we have, uh, at 2,000 years ahead of time, God knows and is, watch, is showing us what's coming. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place. Well, actually, that's Revelation 18 again. It's mislabeled. But we read it from Revelation 13 in our scripture reading. No one would be able to buy or sell unless they have their things in order. So my goal is not really to expound that text to you today, but what I want to do is, is talk to you about a time that I believe is coming when the Bible tells us no one will be able to buy or sell unless they meet certain criteria. In other words, in the last days, there will exist machinery, that is laws, infrastructure, and connectivity on a global scale capable of controlling who can and cannot buy or sell. There will be a truly global financial system. There will be those who are allowed to make purchases, 
And there will be those who are not allowed to make purchases, and there will be deciders who determine which group each person is in. And the deciders are described in Revelation 18 as Babylon, the governmental rulers, and the merchants of the earth. And it's worth noting also that these governmental leaders and megacorporations or governmentalities, at that point, they are servicing the directives of Babylon. So now I want you to think in terms, I'm going to shift gears and talk now about religious liberty. That's digital dollars. Now let's take some of the things we've thought about. I remember that when Jesus drove them out of the money changers out of the temple, what was he unhappy about? They were controlling the money illegitimately. Now we've talked a little bit about digital dollars, which is barreling down on us, coming very quickly. And now I want to shift to religious liberty. I want you to think in terms of religious liberty. Let us suppose that, let's just say, six months from now, I'm just grabbing that out of the air. Let's just suppose that six months from now there's a global financial collapse. Now, by the way, is this hard to imagine? So let's just suppose this happens. Suppose that everything just stops moving where it is. Now you remember back during the COVID time, uh, this is a photograph from, uh, from, the, from LA. And if you look out past Newport Beach and out past further out to the oceans, do you remember that time when all the, um, all the container ships were, were anchored out there? They couldn't offload because the, the ports weren't functioning correctly, and then every, we had, everything was locked down because of COVID, et cetera. And this is just a little photograph of all these ships uh, waiting for weeks at a time, waiting to offload their containers with all the products they're bringing to America to sell here. Imagine a time when suddenly there's a global financial collapse. You'll see this picture again. and you'll have everything stopped. So suppose that that's where it's at. The, the, the banks are closed. The stores are closed. It's an unparalleled emergency. Maybe you cannot buy gas at the gas station, or maybe gas, remember how it plummeted? I took a photograph of it and sent it to my brother in Oregon, who his gas is five or six dollars a gallon sometimes. I sent him a picture when it was at 92 cents a gallon up here at Walmart in Fremont. And that's the way it was. But suppose this is kind of an emergency. Something like this happens. And then let's suppose that the government comes to the rescue with handouts of digital dollars. Because after all, this is exactly uh, what they did in China, although it wasn't a crisis thing. But they started to get, they wanted, the people, wanted to get the people running on digital yuan, uh, which I'm probably not pronouncing rightly, the Chinese money. And so what do they do? They set aside, I forgot how much money, $122 million equivalent. Uh, maybe it was more than that. And all you had to do was sign up. And you then could get your free digital yuan. And now you had basically money just, just dropped into your hand. Of course, it's programmable money. It's this digital money that the government controls and can see with its government eyeball everything that you're buying or selling with that money. But they gave away a bunch of free money. And of course, I guess you can print it out of thin air when, you, uh, when it's digital. Uh, of course, you can print it out of thin air when it's not digital either. But anyway, and they got a whole bunch of people and they got a lot of their citizens using digital yuan. After all, free money. Suppose the government said to you, okay, we're having an emergency crisis, but guess what? Don't worry about it. Peace and safety. Uh, just get a digital ID, get it all settled, and you get $4,000 in free digital United States dollars. That $4,000 might be really handy. And it's going to be hard for us to pass up free money. Sometimes people in the Adventist church, by the way, like to get a pretty good deal. And we think we're getting a really good deal. But sometimes our good deals aren't so good after all. What are you going to do? So keep this in mind now. With digital dollars, every transaction is not only monitored, but it can be approved or disapproved. Every transaction. Not only every dollar you use to buy everything on Amazon is tracked, but every dollar you donate to a church or a charity, the government 
will know you'd sent, you gave that money. Every dollar that the church spends is also completely under the government eyeball. Every dollar, every penny. So keep this in mind. The government would then be watching. So let's say that the government, let's say that the, your denomination employs a pastor or a presenter who openly teaches or preaches that a man is a biological male and that a woman is a biological female and that certain sexual practices are actually immoral. Suppose your pastor actually tells you that. Suppose the government's not keen to have you be told that. Just supposing. This is totally hypothetical. Right? Or let's suppose that maybe your preacher warns against something else that the government wants people to do. Or let's suppose it's not even a preacher. Suppose it's your head elder. And he's preaching something that the government doesn't want preached. Suppose that the denomination prints a book. A book even that warns against some of the great changes and that give ultimate power to the powers mentioned in Revelation 18. Just suppose that there was a book like that. Just imagine that it could be, you know. We don't know of any such book. But uh, suppose that a church set out to print a book like that. Well, what then? What happens when there is a global financial system of digital dollars that a denomination can be excluded from? Because really, here is the threat. The threat that they are waving is, that, that the th they're not waving, but this is the threat, is if you don't play our game our way, total exclusion from the global financial system, that's what you're facing. You know, you play ball with us, you want to worship here at the temple? You want to make your sacrifice at the temple? No problem. We've got the temple shekel. No problem. Just pay up, and we give you temple shekels. You can get your sacrifice and worship and go home. Have a nice day. We're all smiling and happy. But what happens when on a global scale there's a threat of total exclusion from the global financial system? Kind of like when the mob comes and says, boy, those are sure some pretty nice kneecaps you've got there. It'd be a shame if something happened to them. <clears throat> and what we're really looking at today is a challenge, the challenge that I believe the church faces. It's a religious liberty challenge. Once you have digital dollars, the government will watch everything that every church does. Every dollar that the Seventh-day Adventist church spends on any which thing or uses to publish any book that it might happen to publish, or any speaker that might be invited to come and speak. Or maybe we want Doug Batchelor to come and preach at the next Michigan camp meeting. Well, but what if Doug says something that doesn't really need to be said because the government doesn't want it to be said? We can all kind of hear half of it and kind of wink and know what it's about. But what if Doug just blurts it out? Because you know how Doug is. He's just kind of straightforward. Those kind of thoughts or those kind of things are, the, are the, what, what gets you to where you're at a spot where you're afraid to be excluded from the global financial system because, look, the, the, all the, this property, all church properties, there's a title, there's a tax-free thing, and, and the government, it's all linked up. What if, what if you lost your tax exemption because you now are um, saying things they don't want you to say. And so you get into this thing where basically you censor yourself. And what we are looking at, a great risk, I believe a religious liberty risk to us, is that in the closed system, a denomination has many exposures to threats by governments and governmentalities. It's an enormous risk. Human nature being what it is, we can expect that in spite of our best intentions, we will engage in self-censorship. We will become extremely careful, extremely careful about what we publish. We will become extremely careful about what we say. We will become rigorously bound by guidelines and rules that we will develop. And we will begin to be dumb dogs that don't bark because we can't afraid to bark, but if we bark, we might be excluded from the global financial system. Oh, no! 
And there's the problem. There are many grave risks that come to our faithful execution of our mission in a world in which digital dollars have become the norm. So I'm saying to you that digital dollars are a magnificent threat to religious liberty. Even if it's partially indirect, it is an enormous threat. Digital dollars mean that even the tiniest transaction by every individual and every church is fully monitored. We may think that we will continue to faithfully tell the truth to ourselves and to others, but the eye of Caesar, the eye of Pharaoh, the eye of Stalin, the FBI would change the way that we operate. Once we're on a digital dollar, the church will be struggle to really be faithful in religious liberty. Sorry. I'm very sorry. Maybe I'm all wrong. Well, this week, now I'm shifting gears again to the last uh, line here. This week, Pope Francis uh, came out with a new encyclical. It's called Laudate Deum, which means praise God. And uh, it's not a very long one. I forgot how long it took to read it. Not very long. It's only a hundred and some paragraphs. Notice what it says here. Uh, Laudati Deum of the Holy Father Francis to all people of goodwill on the climate crisis. This isn't just written to the Catholic people. This is written to everyone. This is written to you and me. This is kind of like an email from the Pope to you. So consider yourself a happy person, the Pope just emailed you. So I read this through two or three times here the other yesterday, because this only came out on um, Wednesday, October 4. And it was actually, I couldn't find it. And finally, um, finally, I caught it at the very end of the day. So this is the latest thing. And just to clarify, I believe that the Pope, he's a Jesuit Pope. I don't believe he's a man of God. Maybe he thinks he is. I don't know what he thinks. I can't read his mind. But I can read the things he writes. Okay. He is an agent in my understanding. Well, now I'm back to what do I say? Because if I'm recording this. Uh, let me just say I believe that uh, he's, he's in charge of the beast power. Right? So he's not necessarily a good guy. Anyway. He comes out with this message, and it's basically about climate change. And let me give you a few quick reactions to it, and then I'm going to share a couple of paragraphs for, for you. Uh, here's one. Now, this is um, the Jesuit Review. So you'd expect them to have, like, a certain line, right? But this is dated October 6th, so this is yesterday. This is pretty fresh. And there it is right on the page. Pope Francis delivers a message of despair in Laudati Deum. We ignore it at our peril. Well, not a surprise. It's... The Catholics talking about a Catholic thing. Here's another one. Uh, this one is, I forgot the news source on this one. Climate activists around the world applaud the Pope for prophetic new eco-doc. Notice the date, if you can read it up there, October 6th. This is yesterday. And here's a bunch of guys, and this photograph is in France. And it's got their names. Um, I won't try to read them all here to you. Uh, anyway, the photograph is from October 5. The article, news article is October 6. Happy because the Pope's talking about this terrible climate crisis. So anyway, these are all both Catholic things, and so no real surprise. Is anybody in the regular news talking about it? Here's just one more. Now, can you see what's it say in the upper left corner? It's U.S. News and World Report. And their article... Climate change and its human causes cannot be denied. Papal document says this is dated October 4, Reuters. Okay, so even in the national news, you're, you're hearing about this. And so um, I wanted to say something about it. And so let me do this. Like I said, there's over 100 paragraphs. I'm going to just draw your attention to about three paragraphs. But I'm not going to look at the the ecological part so much. I mean, it's true, when you read it through, he's worried, he says he's worried about climate change. But I'm going to look at something else. 
and with those things with you. So here we go. So this is paragraph 35 of his document. I just pasted it right over from that into the slide, and I did bold and put in yellow the parts that I'm just going to emphasize here. And again, you can, you can find this. If you go to the Vatican website, vatican.va, and click on encyclicals, or somewhere, this is all over the place, there's links to this. So you can find this if you wanted to spend your time reading it. Um, it's not the world's funnest read. But anyway, a couple of interesting bits. Notice what the Pope is talking about. Uh, he says, we are speaking above all of more effective world organizations equipped with the power to provide for the, what? The global common good. Now, this is going to be good. We'll all be happy. You know, put your smiley, put that round uh, smiley face on. Um, we're going to eliminate hunger and poverty, and we're going to defend the fundamental human rights. Yeah, like that's the guy we want for that. Um, anyway, look at the next line. The issue is that they must be endowed. He's talking about governments or these or world organizations. He says this. They must be endowed with what kind of authority? Real authority in such a way as to provide for the attainment of certain, uh, what kind of goals? Essential goals. So world organization, real authority, attaining certain essential goals. Do you see what the Pope wants? Do you see where he's going with this? He want, Well, let me give you more. He wants there to be a global power that can force people to do things that he says have to be done. It's like, like nothing new under the sun. Okay, here's paragraph 42. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read it all, but at the bottom here, the Pope says, it is a matter of establishing global and effective what? rules that can permit, and the, I didn't put the quotes there, that's in the article, permit providing for this global safeguarding. So we're going to help everybody out, don't worry about it. We're going to help you all, but we're going to make sure there's effective rules so that we can provide, we can get this global outcome that we, you know, we all got to have. We just have, we all have to have it. And here's the last paragraph I'll share, paragraph 59. Uh, I'm going to read this whole paragraph because and give you a little bit of the context. If there is sincere interest in making COP28 a historic event that honors and ennobles us as human beings, then one can only hope for binding forms of energy transition that meet three conditions, that they be efficient, obligatory, and readily monitored. This in order to achieve the beginning of a new process marked by three requirements, that it be drastic, intense, and count on the commitment of most people. The Pope says the commitment of all people. Now he says, so far this hasn't happened, but if you want this to be a success, this is what we have to have. So what's the Pope angling for? What's he looking for? We want to have a way to have global control where we can enforce rules, with a real global thing that has real authority and we can do things that are necessary, and we can count on the commitment of all. He wants a supranational global arrangement, a global governmental situation, a global political situation in which there's a group of people who have ultimate control. And by the way, this wouldn't be people that were elected. It's like elections. In another part, I didn't put them all in here, but there's some other things where he says, the systems we have right now really haven't worked. So we needed to make kind of a new system. So he must not like democracy too well. Of course, the papacy is not known for too much democracy. But uh, anyway, he wants something that would be over the world. Now, what might that be? Well, he's kind of running with the United Nations people and people like that, but basically he says, what we've had so far hasn't worked. So what's that? Well, that's basically the United Nations. Is there anything else out there on the horizon that might possibly, possibly, the Pope might be talking about? Well, have you heard of the World Health Treaty? I think it's called the Pandemic Treaty. Uh, but they're not calling it a treaty anymore. They're calling it, um, they picked another name for it because treaties have to be approved by, uh, politically, yeah. So they're calling it a World Health Agreement. 
a pandemic agreement now. I forgot the, what they're calling it. But anyway, they're trying to get uh, all these nations to sign on, and this would give the WHO, the World Health Organization, authority at any time in any place on planet Earth by their leaders to declare a pandemic or an emergency kind of a situation. So if they decided that there was a pandemic in Fremont, Michigan, the World Health guy would just declare it. He'd press the button, and that would be the declaration. And even though we are a local community under the state of Michigan, under the United States, the World Health Organization supposedly then would have ultimate authority to tell us what to do or what not to do. You must wear a mask. You don't, okay, you don't need to wear a mask, but you need to get a shot, or you need to stand on your head, or whatever they want us to do. Uh, tell us absolutely that we, we all are supposed to do it. Now, some people have laughed and said, well, you know, you're making up conspiracies. Uh, the Pope, you know, what does the Pope have to do with the World Economic Forum and, and all that? We know he spoke at the UN. We know he spoke at the United States Congress. But uh, does he have any, he doesn't really have anything to do with the World Economic Forum. So just last thing I'm throwing in here for you before we finish. This is from the year 2020. And this is, uh, you can find it again on Vatican.va. This is the official papal website. And they have all the letters and articles that the Pope writes and publishes. And believe it or not, in the year 2020, the Pope himself wrote a letter to Klaus Schwab. Now, do you know who Klaus Schwab is? Is somebody maybe out of the loop and hasn't heard of Klaus Schwab? So Klaus Schwab is the leader of the World Economic Forum. During World War II, his father ran, uh, he had a big business. He ran a factory in, in Nazi Germany. And, uh, and they also say that Klaus Schwab, as he got older, that he was in, engaged, in, involved with the South Africans having the uh, atomic bomb. They kind of stole the tech and everything. Anyway, I'm not here to push on that. But anyway, Klaus Schwab is kind of the leader of the World Economic Forum. They get together every year at Davos. And they have a big meeting. This is the elite of the, the elite, the rich people of the rich. This is where the top government leaders go, and they all chatter with each other. And this is where they kind of decide how they run the world. Anyway, it turns out that Pope Francis wrote a, a letter to Klaus Schwab. And you can read the whole thing on the Vatican website. And he was encouraging them because the World Economic Forum was celebrating its 50th anniversary. Now, again, this is three years ago. But anyway, I have one little excerpt. That's all I'm going to give you for this, from this little letter. Now, remember, this is 2020. This is the spring, or actually winter of 2020. So this is in the middle of COVID. So there's some context. OK, here's that little paragraph I'll share with you. Just an interesting item here. By the way, I agree with the last part of the paragraph of the sentence. But uh, anyway, let's get the whole, the whole item here. The overriding consideration, never to be forgotten, is that we are all members of one human family. The moral obligation to care for one another flows from this fact, as does the correlated principle of placing the human person rather than the mere pursuit of power or profit at the very center of public policy. So like, yeah, OK, we can all agree with the last piece, right? People are more important than uh, rules and policies. I think we kind of can agree with that. But it's the first part of this statement that's quite interesting to me. The overriding consideration, he tells Klaus Schwab. This is the Pope telling Klaus Schwab. We should never forget this. What? That we are all members of one human family. The moral obligation to care for one another flows from this fact. In other words, what? The global common good we all need to agree and work together for the global common good. We need a system of control, says Pope in Laudato Deum, which we looked at before this, that can basically force the people of the world to follow the narrative, follow what the governments are saying. And remember what we have in Revelation 18? We have the three groups, Babylon, and the Pope would be kind of giantly involved with Babylon. We have the kings of the earth. And that's, who's, that's who meet at Davos in the World Economic Forum and the merchants of the earth. And they meet with them at Davos. And so here is a very interesting line. Probably nobody has ever even heard of this letter to the Pope, but there it is, uh, to um, Klaus Schwab. But here's a letter from the Pope himself to Klaus Schwab himself. 
and just to kind of now pull all this together and summarize it a little bit. I want you to notice that the Pope is calling for global organizations able to control people. And this is kind of like a giant revelation, and yet it's not, because like, when wasn't this true? <laughs> when wasn't the papacy interested in forcing people to do its will? But we just kind of have a kind of a renewal of it here. Here it is. The Pope says that such organizations can help alleviate hunger and poverty. But the fact is that the organizations, as he envisions it, would have the power to trump the Constitution because these would be organizations with the power over nations. Okay. So he's calling for global mechanisms that can force people to take certain actions. Okay, I've already read that. Uh, so let's go to the end here. The Pope insists on a moral obligation to care for one another on a global scale. The way he wants to do it, as Laudate Deum outlines, is to erect a system of global control from which none can dissent. Just as worshipers in the temple in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago found that to make their sacrifice, they had to buy it using the temple shekel from the money changers at an exorbitant price, what had happened there was the money changers had wedged themselves into life so that they had an inescapable chokehold on the worship economy. To bring your sacrifice, you had to engage with the corrupt money-changing system. What the papacy and the technocrats and the transhumanists that he rubbed shoulders with want to do today is they want to do the same thing but to the global economy. They want to make participation in it inescapable, and from that vantage point, to hold in their hands the ultimate lever of inclusion or exclusion from the global financial system. It is a real threat. It is, this is what the papal goal is. It is increasing, and it appears to be a future that's very near, in which for the first time in human history, we may see with our own eyes this approaching system of global financial control. That's what the, he wants, and if he could have it today, he'd have it today. He wants to control all of us through the pocket, through, through our finances. He wants to make participation in this global economy inescapable. And from that vantage point, they want to hold in their hands the ultimate lever of inclusion or exclusion from the global financial system. And that's where I believe we're going. And this week, we saw some more of it. And I gave you some of the Pope's own writing this very week published. Well, let me summarize and conclude now. I would say this, we can see new threats that are looming toward religious liberty. Threats more subtle than ever before. Religious liberty certainly includes the issue of conscientious Sabbath observance, but also it includes much more. Religious liberty includes our individual conscientious right to bodily autonomy. It includes economic autonomy and to live by cultural values differing from the morality of those who would manufacture a new morality that approves of drag queens and looting and approves only the preferred narratives of government and governmentalities. Religious liberty means not only liberty of conscience, but also that liberty of thought which allows us to understand our world and then react to, react to it conscientiously with reference to it. See, having freedom of conscience doesn't mean very much if you don't know what you should be conscientious about. And so freedom of thought, not to have your thoughts censored, not to have the things you want to publish uh, not spoken about because, oh, he's not saying the right things. That's important. And so religious freedom is under threat sort of a couple of steps back more subtly and having the government with its big eyeball, big digital eyeball watching every single thing you do down to lemonade stand transactions, that is an enormous threat to liberty, liberty in the general, liberty more specifically, liberty of thought and more specifically to liberty of conscience. So we're living at a time in history 
that is really quite amazing. Without the freedom to think, we are without the freedom to think morally. As soon as our literal every movement is being monitored by government and its governmentalities, freedom of thought is compromised. Once you have global machinery with actual control and an ability to literally lock people out of the economy, a la Revelation 13, this threat of exclusion from the global financial system will compel us to compel ourselves. We will censor ourselves as surely as day follows night. None of these things have caught heaven by surprise, and Revelation 13 proves it. 2,000 years ago, God told us through his prophet, we're coming to a time when no one can buy or sell. When you do a Bible study on buy or sell, you land at Matthew 21. Jesus removed from the temple these people who were forbidding people to buy or sell but with a temple shekel. Kind of interesting. Interesting little connection. Jesus showed his servant John in exile on Patmos that a day would come when people were prevented from buying and selling unless they would choose ethical compromise. That is, unless they would choose to treat Babylon, the kings of the earth, and the merchants of the earth, unless they chose to treat them as God, then you can, then you can go to the store and buy your Snickers bar. As long as you are ready to say the Pope is God, Bill Gates and his buddies are God, the government is God, Walk right in and buy your Snickers bar. And the big eye of government will see you make your digital transaction with your digital dollar. And somewhere, some AI will smile or something. The people are under my thumb. Good for me. Finally, a word um, that's pretty grim material, but I want to make a suggestion that I think is actually positive. And this is the last line here, the last thing. What do you do? How do you fix this? How can you avoid this? It doesn't seem like there's any immediate obvious way to avoid this. But if you go back 2,000 years to the early church, How much did they do that was approved by Rome? I don't think Rome approved anything the church did. And what we need to do as a church, and what every church needs to do, but hopefully we'll do it because we're the remnant church. Like if we don't do it, who would? But anyway, hopefully what we should do is we should uh, immediately begin to stop and take charge of things and think about this and think about this. Which things do we do that have to be connected to the global financial system? And which things can we as a church do that don't have to be connected to a global financial system? Those things should be, we should have very clear categories for those. So for example, let's say we wanted to have a prayer chain. Or suppose we wanted to meet somewhere and have a prayer meeting. We want to meet somewhere and have a Bible study in our home. Does Klaus Schwab and his buddies and the Pope and, and the digital powers that be, do they need to know that there's a Bible study happening in your home? No. Do they need to know there's a prayer chain that we can do a one call and enlist people in the church to pray for one of our members? No. Of course, we pay for one call, so that might become an issue at some point. But I guess what I'm saying is we need to kind of figure out the things that the church does which can be done totally without money, and the things that the church does that involve money, and we need to have two totally separate sections in our thinking, because we may come to a day when, when we're basically threatened to be locked out of the global financial system. And unless we're able to conduct church without being part of the global financial system, what? We will compromise so that we're not thrown out of the global financial system. It's human nature. And we are not immune to it. So what I'm saying is, on a positive note, yes, this is coming, and I, it seems like it's inescapable, but if we, uh, if we think about it ahead of time, if we begin to recognize before we get there, before this next emergency comes, whenever it is, if we've already kind of sorted things into these two categories, 
And we already can recognize that there are things we can do as a church that don't require us to be tied into the... We can thumb our nose. Not that we would, because Christians wouldn't do that. But we could figuratively thumb our nose to the world financial system and do it our own way. The Pope doesn't need to know about our Bible study. So we could sort things out, and we may have to come to a spot where we have a lot of different ways of doing things than we already do them. Not because we really are just looking to just randomly change every which thing, but because we're coming to a place where unless we make the right changes, we will put ourselves in the position of compromise. And humanly speaking, we will compromise and we will not be able to faithfully deliver the message. So today, digital dollars, religious liberty, and laudati deum, just another week in the end times. But hopefully we can sort out and operate like the early church more and more, which did not ask for any favors or permission from Rome.